All right, welcome to this second video in our series on labor supply. Uh, if you didn't see the previous video where we showed how to set up a budget constraint and think about this diagram on the left, um, pause this one, go, go back and watch that. It should be the previous video in the playlist, and then you can come back and this one should make more sense. All right, so what we're gonna do first is a little review in terms of making a diagram. We're told that the wage is $10 per hour, the price of all other goods is $2 per good, uh, we can divide those two to get the real wage, and I'll write that down. Our real wage, W over P, is five goods per hour. That's a pretty easy calculation. And we know that we should expect this real wage to tell us the slope of our budget constraint once we construct this diagram. That's our conclusion from last slide, uh, last video. All right, so now we got to think about constructing a budget constraint. The first point we can get, the easy one, is that the maximum amount of leisure we can have is just spending all day on leisure, so that's 24 hours. And then we can get a point for the maximum amount of all of their goods we can buy. Uh, that one we'll have to calculate. If we get paid five goods per hour, you know, $10 per hour, but that buys five goods, and we work all 24 hours, we can multiply that and get 120 goods. So the maximum amount of AOG we could get if we worked all day is 120. Now we can connect these dots and get our standard budget constraint, trying as hard as I can to make a straight line. Um, so there we go, that's our budget constraint. And then we're told just for the sake of argument here, just so we can plot some optimal point, that our optimum is eight hours of leisure. So that's basically just enough time to sleep. Sleep counts as leisure. So this, this guy is working really hard. He must really like working, working to get that money to get all of the goods. So we'll draw in a indifference curve that's tangent at eight hours of leisure, trying as hard as I can to make that like a nice indifference curve, and we're told this is eight hours of leisure. Now we want to get, implicitly, we can figure out the amount of all of the goods we can buy. If we spend eight hours of leisure, we must be spending the rest of our time on labor. So we can see that on the diagram, this gap between eight and 24 is our amount of labor and that is 16 hours. So we're spending 16 hours uh, working. We get five goods per hour, so that gives us enough money to buy uh, 80 goods, if I can calculate. So our current optimal consumption is 80 goods of the all other goods and eight hours of leisure. And now what we wanna think about is, suppose the wage increases. So our thought experiment for this video is gonna be a wage increase, and what I'll encourage you to do after this video is make a make an analysis of a wage decrease if the wage increases let's say it doubles let's say the wage goes up to twenty dollars per hour uh, but the all of the goods price stays the same at two dollars per good then we'll get a new budget constraint we'll still have this point here with 24 hours of leisure as our maximum but we'll be able to buy more all of their goods in fact we'll be, we don't since the wage doubled we'll be able to buy twice as many all of their goods so our new maximum amount of Y we can buy is here at 240. All right, so let me draw in that new budget constraint. And now I want to think about, you know, where will I end up on this diagram? There's actually a lot, just visually, that you can kind of see there's a lot of points that I could pick that are better than my current consumption on this new budget constraint. Um, pretty much all of this area, you know, this point is just as good that I'm trying to highlight. This right here is on the original indifference curve. So this point's just as good, but I can do better by just moving into the, into this range here. But that there's a lot of points in that range. I could end up at a point here where I'm doing uh, less leisure. I could conceivably end up at a point like here where I'm doing more leisure. It looks like kind of no matter where I go, I'm probably gonna have more all of their goods. Theoretically, you could end up down here, but we're gonna make an assumption to rule that out. So visually, it looks like there's gonna be some ambiguity about whether I work more or less, even though you might think intuitively, since my wage is going up, I, I should be working more. So let's see if we can capture that in terms of substitution and income effects, uh, and see if our geometric intuition is right, that it's kind of ambiguous, or whether our sort of economic intuition is right, that it's you should work more. So we can start by thinking about the substitution effects. Here, we have an implicit price of leisure. As you remember from the last video, the, the wage is basically the implicit price of leisure. So leisure has now become in effect, more expensive. There's a higher opportunity cost. So our substitution effect is going to be to do less leisure. And then since you always have opposite substitution effects, it's gonna to be to do 
more all of their goods. If you're doing less leisure, you're working more. You're going to buy more all of, all of their goods. We're going to assume both of these are normal goods so that we can fill in the income effect. So we'll assume AOG and leisure are both normal. And because they're both normal goods, we know that if we're richer, we'll buy more of both. If we're poor, we'll buy less. When your wage is going up, it's pretty intuitive that you, you've, in a sense, become richer, right? We have more possibilities we can choose from now. We can choose anything on this big, further out budget constraint, whereas before we were poor, we could only afford anything on here. So our income effects are both unambiguous. They're going to be more leisure, more all of their goods. So we can see from this table that it's unambiguous. We're definitely going to consume more at this higher wage. We're going to get more all of their goods. But our leisure is ambiguous. Our geometric interpretation from the graph is right. And our economic intuition that you'd think you'd work more if your wage goes up is actually not right. That intuition is because we're focusing on the substitution effect. You'd want to work more. You'd want to substitute more work um, because it's expensive not to work when you're getting paid hundreds of dollars per hour, uh, you know, say. But the income effect is that if your wage is really high, you know, maybe you should just not work so much. If you were paid a million dollars per hour, you'd probably just work maybe an hour a day because there's no real point working five hours a day and getting five million dollars a day when you probably could buy everything you want with just the one hour and the one million. So that's the intuition for why our labor supply actually might increase or decrease when the wage goes up. What we're going to do in the next video is plot a labor supply curve and see how this influences the shape. It isn't necessarily upward sloping. But the last thing I want to talk about is that a lot of the time when we do these income and substitution effect tables with this labor supply model, we like to add a third column. Even though it doesn't carry any new information, it will help keep your thinking straight. Um, and it's a labor column. And the reason that it doesn't carry any new information is that all of your time is divided up between leisure and labor. So if we know what's happening to your leisure, we know the opposite's happening to your labor. If you substitute less leisure, you're doing more labor. If you're consuming more leisure, you're doing less labor. Uh, so these two arrow arrows are up and down. And overall, the labor, the amount of labor you supply is ambiguous. Um, the reason we like to include that is just so that you don't forget about what's happening to labor. If you have, if you keep track of leisure in your head, um, and you know labor is the opposite, sometimes you know you double flip. You're like leisure goes down, so labor goes up, blah, 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 but it's flipped, so it's down, and you make some dumb mistakes like that. So I would, in general, recommend making three columns for this income and substitution effect table. All right, so I hope to see you uh, soon in our third part of this series on labor supply, where we're going to plot a labor supply curve using these diagram, reading this diagram and translating it into a labor supply. So I hope to see you there.